Okay, we're back. We're live. It's given Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech and um, Dan Figleaf, retired lieutenant general from the United States Air Force, joins us today. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, Jay. Good to be back again. I'm kind of a frequent flyer. I appreciate Absolutely. the opportunity. You are a frequent flyer, indeed. <laughs> you have a multiple a number of shows on Think Tech. You're a director of Think Tech, and uh, you have been around in so many ways. Um, and today we're doing military in Hawaii, and in fact, you, uh, I think you sit on the council, the Military Affairs Council mm -hmm. uh, of the Chamber of Commerce, which organizes this show. And today we're going to commemorate and talk about uh, Zaps Latifer, who was a Navy four star here in the fleet, um, had a remarkable career. We're going to talk about um, how you have a remarkable career uh, in the United States military. But let's, let's talk about Zaps Latifer first. He was a four star had a really interesting career, was an interesting individual, an example of leadership and kindness, um, both in terms of uh, making it happen and in terms of dealing with people. But how would you characterize him? You knew him, uh, yeah. and, and, and you could say he was your friend. Well, uh, um, I think the best way to characterize him is we, many of us have struggled for words at his loss because he's such a special guy. Is, that anybody who was, was his friend might have felt like they were his best friend because he had a way of really connecting with people um, that was remarkable. And, you know, four stars are generally pretty remarkable. They're special people. I retired as a three star, and I'll admit up front that there's a big difference between somebody who becomes a four star and us three stars. We're not mere three stars, but they're generally special. He was one of the most special and one of the best human beings I've ever known. He's a very friendly guy. His office yeah. uh, as uh, one of the trustees of the Campbell Estate was in Pioneer Plaza. Our studio was in Pioneer Plaza. We saw him all the time. And there was never a time when he wasn't so warm and friendly. Um, he, was, he was just a, a great guy to have there in the building and there around. Helped you yeah. feel good. He was a feel-good guy. Feel good, but do good too. I mean, he wasn't. Um, and he wasn't just warm and fuzzy. I've probably sat in well over a hundred various meetings with him, and back when I was in the military here, and he retired, and uh, in the Counselor Corps, which he was very active in, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, all those. And I was reflecting, getting ready for this discussion. Uh, I never heard Admiral Zapp get. Grumpy, say anything unkind or anything irrelevant and not worth saying. He was a positive force, but he was also a force. And <laughs> frankly, I can't claim the same uh, type of participation in all meetings. I can get grumpy. He just made everything he was involved in better. And I, I really mean that. Now, I told you before the show began, I was reading. The use of AI by the United States military, mm -hmm. and for that matter, competing with the use of AI by China, and uh, it, it struck me that uh, one thing that uh, Zap was fully aware, fully conscious of, was was technology. Uh, and I I tell you that because I want to tell a short story about his sure. first appearance on Think Tech, which has got to be mm, let's say fifteen years ago. Um, the story is this: it was a Gulf War, and he was the about to ship off to the Gulf War, and um, he, he, he went to uh, Radio Shack. Uh, too bad, Radio Shack, no more. Um, but it yeah. was in, I think he went to Kailua Radio Shack, if there was one there, and he bought a dish, um, and, uh, and he brought it to the ship. He was commanding the ship at the time, um, and uh, he had, had the crew paint it, um, you know, gray, navy gray, and put it <laughs> on the fantail, um, and they steamed off to, you know, the Gulf War. And every morning, uh, the brass would meet on aircraft carrier there, and then uh, he would join them and take the launch and join them. And um, they always wondered why Zap knew more than any of them about what was going on right now, real time, uh, ashore in the war. Come to find, um, he had this Radio Shack um, dish, and he was getting CNN. And CNN was pushing all this information about the war. A reporter by the name of Deborah Wong, as I remember. And um, there you go. And uh, they were so impressed with him that he, he had the, what do you want to call it, out-of-the-box thinking 
uh, that could grab what, what was consumer technology and make it work for the military. And I'll never, ever forget that story. That makes perfect sense, as you know, the man, because he's very thoughtful about what will work. He didn't get parochial or constrained by uh, prior notions. He wondered what would work best and solve the problems that needing, needed solving in any realm, in the military, in business, in the community affairs, very solutions oriented. Well, the, the other time he appeared was uh, when uh, we did an Independence Day program and we had a number of um, retired military come down and tell us why they cared about Independence Day. And I will ne and he was remarkable in his rendition of that. I told you before how, how it touched me. Uh, he was extremely passionately, emotionally patriotic. Um, and during Vietnam, he was in the Vietnam theater. He was in the mm -hmm. Gulf War number one, and he was in, gee, I, I, he, was, he was in, he only retired one in, uh, only a few years ago, 96, I want to say. Yeah. Um, Gee, I uh, got to say that's more than a few years ago now. We're, we're <laughs> getting out. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> and um, he was ferrying a fighter uh, from the east yeah. coast of Vietnam. And uh, if it just so happened that he was flying over the United States mainland um, at the time um, uh, of the of sunset on July 4th. And as and he described this, it gives me chicken skin even now okay. as he flew west. Uh, toward the west coast, people were setting off fireworks for July 4th, and he could see them below. He could see the whole country uh, doing July 4th fireworks. It was a fantastic experience to see the whole, the whole country celebrating July 4th all together. And he described that in words and feelings. I will never forget um, how it touched me and how supremely patriotic he was, which is an element about about officers in general in the military and senior officers especially, um, you get to invest your life, you get patriotic. And, and I know that feeling from my own time in the service, but he was yeah. uh, so emotional about it. I, I think the distinction, to one of the many things that makes made Admiral Zapp special was he was thoughtfully patriotic. Um, it wasn't uh, that he denigrated any other nation, any other nation, it's that he recognized the special opportunity and therefore responsibility that the United States had. Very active in the Counselor Corps as the Honorary Council of Slovenia. Um, and uh, so, you know, he, he was, he represented all that's good about America. And like most combat veteran, uh, veterans, I think I told you uh, this story, Jay, when we we're getting ready to do this, uh, that um, the most compassionate people I've met are those who've seen real combat, uh, especially senior leaders who've seen it over a career. And Zap was a very warm, compassionate man. At the same time, great presence under fire. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, looked up the, uh, the, the famous Forrestal, uh, the carry of Forrestal fire mm -hmm. of 1967. He was uh, 25 and a young lieutenant at the time, and uh, he played a role in the sense that he, 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 he documented all the things that happened over that day and a half or so. It took him to put out the, the fire, both above decks and below decks, and um, he, be, he became an important member of the team that understood the fire, that understood the lessons of the fire, an extraordinary event. Uh, were you in the service then? Do you remember that fire? No, uh, not yet. So I came on active duty in late 1974, but he, he's a great example of somebody who um, survived trial by fire, both on the forest all literally, and then as an A-6 pilot uh, flying in Vietnam, and, and he passed every test. And uh, as good a guy as it was, it isn't that he wasn't proud. He was very proud of, for example, having a thousand carrier landings, uh, of being one of the first new pilots to fly the A-6 just out of flight school. He was very proud of his Corvette. As a Mustang guy, I was offended by that, but um, <laughs> but he was proud, but not prideful. You know, he took great joy in life and, um, and the silly pleasures of life and the very serious pleasures of life, more in the serious pleasures, but he wasn't, you know, he, he was just a, 
uh, an exemplar for all of us. If I could be more of anything, I'd be more like my daughter, who has been on pigments, of course, and is just not some human being, yeah, or more like Zap. Can't because I'm me, but he's, he was a great example in every way. And Jay, he, you know, he, as I said, four stars are, you know, that's something to get that far. The pyramid is extremely steep to get up that far. Um, but after the Navy, he was successful at everything he did. And he did a lot of different stuff. When I first met him back in 2005 as the deputy commander, U.S. Pacific commander, I remember talking to him about a business venture that he'd embarked on, but it's not even mentioned in his bio or any of the tributes. It was remarkable. And he clearly got it and went after it with great enthusiasm and succeeded at that. And he was successful as a philanthropist and a community leader and as a husband and father, just a truly a complete man and a complete success. Yeah, his bio um, shows you he, he went to so many schools, took, took degrees. And when, he, and when he was out of the service, he sat on so many boards and was involved in so many companies. At the same time, if you, if you look at his, um, you know, his bio, is, this is my reaction. There's a certain abiding modesty about it. Yeah. It, it is, there's a modesty. And indeed, that's consistent with the way it was to say hello to him in the lobby mm -hmm. of, the, of the Pioneer Plaza building. He was infinitely modest. You looked at him and you shook his hand and you introduced him to somebody. Um, he was, uh, um, there was no sign of all his achievements. He was no, just, and a, he... just an ordinary nice guy. Um, I met a neighbor of mine. He's a neighbor I've communicated with by email uh, because of, uh, I'm the security guy for a neighborhood board. So, you know, I get it. But anyway, he w was one of Admiral Zapp's golf partners when the Admiral would play golf. And every time I communicated with his friend John, John would tell me um, how humble Zapp was to him because he had just been an enlisted soldier in Vietnam, John had. And he said, the four star treated me like, like a peer all yeah. the time from the beginning. And um, he did that uh, with everybody. Like I, like I said, I think all of us think maybe we were his best friend because he made us all feel that way. So, I, you know, we were talking before about this. Uh, I, I like to talk to you about some of these seniors. They're so interesting and they make such a great contribution, not only to Mm -hmm. uh, retire in Hawaii, but to the community in general, to the country. They're special people. Uh, it, it wasn't an accident that uh, you know, they became seniors. As in, in most cases. cases. In most cases. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Person, company included. <laughs> yeah. so, so, you know, I, I guess uh, the one thing that struck me was he didn't go to the Naval Academy. Uh, yeah. You can get to be a four-star without going there. And I the other thing that struck me was I asked you, um, you know, uh, does does a young officer decide early on that he wants to be a four star and go for the brass ring? And you said no, that would that would work the other way. Yeah, I that? yeah, I said uh, actually that's the surest way to not make generals to think you want to be a general or an admiral. But um, I suppose there are people like that, but it's such a long path, you know, your average. Uh, one star admiral or one star general probably has served 24 to 25 years. And if you, I can't imagine what would happen to you emotionally and physically if you spent 24 years chasing the, that brass ring. Um, it's, it's so rare. And this is a good way to comment on Zap and some of the other folks our island has, has been blessed with as long term residents. But it, it's such a hunt and requires so much good fortune. And what, when you are selected as a new one star general or one star admiral, I'm sure the Navy does the same as the Air Force. One of your admonitions is to recognize how many people there are that um, are better than you and more qualified than you that, that didn't make it. And it's striking as you look at the thank you notes that you get, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the congratulatory notes, you think, boy, this guy would have been a better choice than me. I mean, if you're, 
any kind of a person, there are some people you think that way. And the same is true from my perspective is for those of us who don't make four stars, my, the, that guy, Admiral Zapp, Admiral Hayes, Admiral Fargo, General Jones, the, all these are all four stars who live in Hawaii. Yeah, I, know, I can see why they made it, and I understand why I didn't. <laughs> and some of it's luck and timing, yeah. but these are people who dedicate themselves to their country, who perform uh, at, at the highest level in the most difficult jobs, and therefore the President of the United States, whomever that might be at the time, puts their trust and confidence in them to lead at the highest levels. With all so of that, generally great men and women. With all of that, retiring into the civilian community after, you know, three decades or more of, um, you know, being an officer, mm -hmm. a senior officer in the United States military, that's that's a that's a uh, somewhat traumatic, isn't it? I remember in the Coast Guard, yeah. uh, I would I would consult with some of the uh, the brass that was leaving at the end of their you know careers. And they were, for the most part, quite concerned about whether the skills um, they had achieved in the service would be useful in the military. And I always comfort them about that. No, no problem. You will see how, you know, your skills put you above head and shoulders against most people. But tell me what it's like. Well, I think it's, it's a big change, duh. That's a clear statement of the obvious um, that you have to be prepared for. The best way to... Um, be prepared for it is to recognize how fortunate you were to make it that far and not be bitter for, about whatever job you didn't get because everybody doesn't get some job at the end you know and everybody is is asked and it's kind of a funny thing when you're when you're done as a general or admiral they just kind of say dude you're done and you're not getting another job and it's time to move on um, and if if you feel bad about that First of all, I think it's crazy, but it's also very unhealthy. Uh, I was fortunate to have a bad example. I watched Brett Favre's retirement from my cherished Green Bay Packers, and he did not handle that well. That was the <laughs> same year I retired from the Air Force, so I knew not to cry at the ceremony or or feel sorry for myself. And um, I, this is a sort of a small point, but I think it's very important. The advice I give anybody retiring from the Air Force or another branch of the service is for at least a month between the, what you're doing now and what you're doing next, do something completely consuming and, un, and not connected. So I shipped my Harley Davidson to Seattle, Washington and, and rode to the four corners of the United States, 8,532 miles. Yes, I remember. Wow. Yeah, in, in 17 days. And it was therapeutic because once that was done, now I had to go about getting a job, deciding on what my next professional life was going to be. But you got, you do have to kind of have a clear break. And then, as you said, Jay, I, I mean, these guys, guys like Zap or um, all the other, the others that I mentioned, they can do anything. I mean, they've proven it because no job in the military is the same. That's one thing that I found the defense industry I worked in that didn't appreciate as well as it should have is you can expect success in different endeavors because every job you get is different than the last one. It's a, at a different level. It might be flying a different aircraft. It's always in a different location or almost always. And so, the, you know, I, I'm firmly convinced I could be a major league baseball manager. <laughs> Probably couldn't, but, you know, but there's no... I, I'm sure you could. I'm sure you could. <laughs> so, so, go ahead. So, so Fig, I mean, you and uh, Zap, you both made the decision to retire in Hawaii. And mm -hmm. you could have retired anywhere in the world. You could have had your gear moved. You could have established um, whatever it takes um, and, um, and settled anywhere. And so you have to sit at least for a little while and think, where am I going to retire? And, oh, and big, am, I, am I committed to that place? Mm -hmm. So why did you retire here? And if you know, why did he retire here? Yeah, I, I know Zap loved Hawaii, so I'm not going to presume to speak for him, but I'll talk about I'll briefly about my journey. I actually retired and went back to Virginia and worked for a big defense company, knowing that I'd come back to Hawaii. And 
but what brought me back to Hawaii was to be the director of the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center of Security Studies. That, number one, because that was a job I lusted after because it's such a remarkable institution. And two, because it got me back to Hawaii. Um, the, the most important thing to note is all of the senior officers that I mentioned who elected to settle in Hawaii. Um, I don't think I mentioned Dave Bramlett for uh, the Army, uh, four star, uh, but they all are making some form of sacrifice to live in Hawaii. And uh, for starters, it's going to be harder to see your kids and grandkids generally, and that, that matters and your friends and your family, and if you got aging parent, whatever. We, we all know that we live here, that it's a choice. For those retiring four stars, it will make um, the financial aspects of being a retired four star more challenging because the, the four stars, because they've succeeded so well, are such, um, have such a broad knowledge and the connections, they're in great demand back in the mainland. There's less opportunity here. <laughs> now, Admiral Zapp did very well because he's really good at stuff, um, but but it's it's a challenge. So they do it because they love Hawaii and they care about Hawaii. So it's not just man, I love walking around without in shorts without socks on, which I do. Um, it's uh, they they hit, develop an affection for the the islands, the people, the needs of the community. I want to give credit to an organization that, that I think is really largely responsible for that. And that's the uh, Chamber of Commerce Military Affairs Council, because while they're on active duty, they interact with that. They get to know folks like Jen Sabas, who I'm sure you know, who will probably kick me in the butt for giving a shout out. But you know, that connection is woven during their time on active duty. Uh, and it's a, a meaningful weave. It's not just a feel-good social sort of thing. Of what are the needs of the community? What are the needs of the military and the community? And um, and so that draws them back here. And I know I'm rambling a bit, uh, Jay, but but I I found and I think it's pretty common that when you leave after 33 years of service, if you just go get a job and make money, it can be a great job for a great company, mine was, um, you, have a, you have a void, you have a service deficit, you're used to serving and, and it's a, it becomes a need. It's not just, there may not be any goodness in my heart, but it was what I had done, I think there is, but. But that is not necessarily it. It's a selfish need to feel like you're contributing to society. And the connections we build in Hawaii make some of us choose to do it here. Yeah, well, I wanted to talk about community. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of Pacific Forum. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, we, we have Carl Baker of a Pacific Forum come out, mm -hmm. coming on the show every now and then. And he's a great guest. Um, and Pacific Forum has its Board of Governors meeting every year, and, and um, uh, the military is, in, is, is a good percentage of the members and, and the supporters of Pacific Forum. It's, it represents, in my view anyway, the community of military leaders uh, who, are, who have been here, who have grown mm -hmm. up with Pacific Forum, and who form the nucleus uh, of that community. And, and I wonder, you know, uh, whether that community is part of it, because that, that sure. will allow a retired um, military leader to rub shoulders with his peers, with people he knew in the service through his career, and maybe others he didn't, um, and, uh, you know, establish a kind of connection, um, not only to Hawaii, but to the community in Hawaii, where uh, people understood what it was like to be in the service. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It, and it's not just those service connections in the Pacific Forum, because it, it, we, but we do, you know, the active duty officers do interact with the PAC Forum, with APCSS, with East West Center uh, during their time here. I think there's something else that's at least as important. They find that it's different here. Um, you have a different perspective. The white perspective is a unique element of American strategic thought. We're not constrained by the swirl of politics in Washington, D.C. 
you know, did a figments on reality episode on the Washington problem. It's, I'm not, I'm not, okay, I am denigrating the thinking in Washington, regardless of political party, because it's self-reinforcing. And here, where we're a little freer to think outside whatever box may be constraining your strategic concepts, and because it's more directly informed by interaction with other partners and competitors in Asia Pacific, I think it's a better place to think and do things about American security. And um, I know I found that attractive. I, you know, space the director of APCSS, even though it was a Department of Defense institution, we did things differently because we're in Hawaii. And immodestly, I would say the team, not me, did things better and to more effect because they weren't confined to conventional quote unquote wisdom. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to do a show with you about uh, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. I remember meeting you and interviewing yeah. you there while you were. Studying. Absolutely. First time back in the studio when we did studio stuff, right? <laughs> um, anyway, so, you know, what, what Zap Slatipper's passing um, is somehow emblematic of the aging of that community. Yeah. And I don't know if it happens as much anymore where a senior officer will say, well, it's 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 a good choice for me. I'll go to Hawaii. I'll um, I'll engage with that community, and you know there's oak clubs and golf courses, and and as you say, it's a good strategic place to do your mm -hmm. thinking, if you're a retired military. Um, but query: Are there as many people retiring into Hawaii as there used to be, and what's the future yeah. of that? And what does his passing mean in terms of the, you know, the 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 energy, if you will, mm -hmm. of the retired military community here in Hawaii. It means those of us who are still here have to pick up our game because we lost a big leader. Um, it means that we, we, the broader community in Hawaii on Oahu, that's engaged in military civilian dialogue, and it goes beyond that, has to recognize that folks like us are getting older and we need to continue to refresh the gene pool because it's good good for why it's good for the security of the united states and um there you know there's a we have a real um core of those senior leaders um some are younger some are older but we need to keep refreshing it um I, th I think it's important as i said for Hawaii and for the country and those leaders in that community provide a lot of valuable nutrition um, not only to the business and the nonprofit right. community of which you guys are always serving in so many, you know, NGOs and nonprofits and, and for that matter, profit companies because of your leadership experience and skills. So you provide a certain nutritious, um, you know, uh, kind of contribution uh, to the society in, in Hawaii. And what I find interesting uh, is that there's there's another side to the yin and yang there. I mean, it goes mm -hmm. back to the overthrow, and there's a certain amount of resentment about the American military, even though fact is that that um, the Navy was in Pearl Harbor in the year 1850, 1850, way back when. Um, and and also, you know, we had the Massey case back in the, back in the 30s, I guess it was, that alienated people about the military. But the bottom line is the, the military and um, the community in general in Hawaii, uh, they're inextricably intertwined. It's part of Hawaii culture as much as so many other things. And my concern, I'm interested in your reaction, is mm -hmm. I want it to stay that way. Yeah. I, want, I want these senior officers like you and Zap Slatterper to be here, to retire here, to be active here, to make your contribution to the community in terms of nonprofits and community boards and organizations, uh, to organizations like APCSS, and of course, to the business community. I, I don't want that to decline because I think it's really critical going forward to remain, remain mm -hmm. um, viable as a community. What are your thoughts about all that? Well, I, I agree. Obviously, it'd be kind of silly to disagree with something as, as well-intended as that. I'm confident it will. As you said, we're intertwined naturally because we're on small islands and with as many military and civilian communities, they're going to be intertwined. 
the question is, are they positively intertwined? And if the leaders of the military aren't appreciative, understanding, and respectful of the environment they brought into, social, cultural, and every kind, then that and, and it's just this forced uh, interaction, that's not good. But with senior retired leaders here, and this was my own experience back in 2005 when, when I came back to Hawaii as the Pacific Command Deputy Commander, um, folks like Admiral Fargo and Admiral Sladapur and, and other leaders put their arm around you and say, hey, Fig, okay, this is really important. You, you know, you need to go to this event or you ought to talk to these folks or, and and uh, it was gentle, <laughs> but firm advice that this is this is how this is what works in Hawaii, which isn't necessarily what works in name another state. I won't pick one because it would seem like I was picking on it. There, I had great experiences in the places I was stationed. But what works in Hawaii is not necessarily the same as what works elsewhere. And, those retired senior leaders who generally know each other or quickly come to know them and who are ob obviously, or at least to me, worthy of our respect, steer, us, steer senior leaders in the right direction. And, you know, we've got, you know, we have a lot of repeat offenders. I say in jest, that term, but we, a lot, many of us come back. I'd been at Hickam as a, as a captain when I, uh, you know, back in the 80s and came back here as a general, as a three-star. Uh, so we're not new to it, but things are different. And those retired senior leaders influence the integration of new senior leaders into the community and uh, very important. Well, uh, Fig, you know, this whole discussion has been kind of a eulogy for Zap Flatterper looking mm -hmm. at it from various points of view and all that. And we have a minute left. But I wonder if there's anything else we should say or that you would like to say in the way of, um, you know, concluding the eulogy, so to speak. I mean, mm -hmm. to speak, for example, to people who didn't know him, what should they know? What yeah. should they remember? What, what makes him special? What was the you know, the special sauce, the special contribution that should be in the public memory about Zap Flatterper? It was, um, I, I think it's what we should all strive for. He was a good person. I mean, he's incredibly talented, very charismatic, funny as can be. But he, he exuded goodness and kindness. Part of why he felt fit so well here in Hawaii. Doesn't mean he couldn't have an edge. As I said, he was funny and he was proud of his accomplishments. But he started with um, being a kind, thoughtful human being. And that's something we can all work on with Zap as the example. Yes. And there are a lot of officers in the military that are like that. But he was um, the example. Yes. He, he took that yeah. to new levels, and we greatly appreciate even a few minutes with him over, over time. Yeah. I miss him. Many of us do. Uh, Dan Figleaf, United States Air Force, retired uh, lieutenant general, joining us today to talk about Zap Flatterper, uh, recently de de deceased uh, four-star Navy Admiral here in Hawaii, a part of our community. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.